Is the bottom there? Okay. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, uh, distinguished guests, music enthusiasts. My name is Elena Rosberg. I'm a radio and TV host, and I'm thrilled to stand before you this night to embark on a musical journey with the incredible David Frick. Please, let's welcome our guest here tonight. And thank you for being with us. Thank you very much. That's very kind of you. How are you, David? I'm doing really well. I'm a little uh, overwhelmed because uh, this is my first time in Sofia in Bulgaria. And I've been referred to as a legend way too often. And that's only in the last 24 hours. Um, it's, I feel very kind of humbled and uh, grateful that people, y'all have shown up and are listening to this because um, I'm a writer. Usually I'm the one who asks the questions. So yeah. to turn that over to Elena is, uh, it's good fun and it's also a bit, um, I'm a little nervous. Besides being a brilliant writer, he is actually a rock and roll star in journalism. And I test him uh, today, test his uh, deep, rich voice, because he's a radio host on Sirius XM. What's the name of your uh, show there? It's Writer's bro Block, right? right. Yeah. Well, I called it the Writer's Block. I was a little nervous about that, because I don't know if you have a, uh, a phrase for it here, but Writer's Block is something that writers really worry about. Like, I can't think of anything. I'm stuck. I, what am I going to write about? And I've never actually had writer's block, but when I talked to my uh, uh, producer executive at Sirius and he wanted me to come up with a name, I thought, oh, well, it's, it's a one-hour show, it's a block of music, it's the writer's block. And the way I describe it is, it's a radio show about writing, about music. And it's essentially, as we were talking about earlier, it's journalism on the air. All of the same ideals about discussing music, trying to bring stories out, find out more about the process of creation, the artist's motivation, like what drives you to do this and what were you listening to that made you wanna turn that page, turn that corner. I get to do that and play the record at the same time. When you're a writer, all you get to do is describe it and that's really rough work, you know, to really, speak articulately and vividly about music, it's a lot harder than people think. Anyone who's a writer out there, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about, because you don't want to fall into cliche. And simply comparing something to another artist, you know, and, and people do this a lot, it sounds like so-and-so meets so-and-so doing such-and-such, and that's comparison, it's not writing. And so I do everything in my power to avoid that. So to be able to do it on the air, to talk with the artists and have the kind of conversations that I would have with them in print, it's great. And I also don't have to transcribe the tape, which is really important because that's a lot of work as well, as you well know. Yes, let me start from the beginning. What do you think is the most significant change in the world of music between Woodstock and Power Trip Festival? <laughs> ha! Okay. Um. Well, maybe this hasn't changed as much as we might think, but I think one of the biggest changes right now is that artists are paid even less now than they were in 1969. And that's accounting for changes in currency and value. Um, it used to be you could buy a cup of coffee for 55 cents, you can't do that now. But what is very, uh, I think, distressing is that we talk about how much we love a certain artist, we talk about how important the music is and you know why we listen to it, and then you listen to it on your phone. 
and you don't buy the record because it's right there. And the fact is, if you're listening to it on your phone, the artist is getting a fraction of a fraction of a penny for that. And what you're essentially doing is you're not buying the music, you're renting it. And you're paying that rent to the landlord, which is Spotify or Apple, Universal Music, Sony. No disrespect, I'm not a corporate, anti-corporate guy, but the fact is very little of that money is going to the artist, and certainly any artist here knows that. Um, I wish that there was a way to rectify that if people feel that you know the phone or their computer or whatever, if you end up using virtual reality goggles or whatever the hell they are, that if there was a way to compensate the artist for the work, because the same work has to go into the music. You write the song. You find a way to produce it. You find a way to get it out there. The same work has to be done as there was in, you know, when the Beatles made their first album. They had to write the songs. They had to go into the studio. They had to rehearse them, play them, press them up. Same amount of work. You do that now, unless you're selling your record at the merch table, um, you're going to get less than pennies on the dollar. And I wish there was a way to um, remind people that having a relationship with the music and the artist is not a one-way street. That the artist should be compensated and compensated fairly. Yeah. Speech over. <laughs> <laughs> and how your uh, role as a music journalist has changed during yes. this period of time? Well, actually, my role, as I see it, has not changed. What's changed is the way it gets out there, which is part of what we've just been, what I was just ranting about. Um, when I'm writing, I'm doing exactly the same work I did when... I first started trying to do it, which is learn as much as I can about the subject ahead of time, um, prepare questions and ideas that are going to help me tell a story to further the discussion I would have with an artist, um, the amount of listening that I would do, the amount of commitment I would have for the conversation itself. Granted, there's a difference now in the amount of time that you often get with an artist. Um, when I was working at Rolling Stone, I would often spend a week on the road with somebody. A lot of uh, journalists don't have that opportunity, and I totally understand that. But if you've got, if you have a half hour with somebody, with any artist, whether it's you know Keith Richards or a guy in a band, you know a woman uh, singer songwriter, you know from down your street. The same amount of commitment has to go into that conversation to get something back that is worth reading. And that never changes. The avenues of how it gets out there, it's all different. You know, magazines don't exist to the same degree that they did when I was able to, you know, practice my craft. Um, online, I think some of the editing can be a little, you know, obviously people are writing and editing for speed. You know, if something happens, it should be online a half hour later. I used to work at newspapers, so I understand the importance of making sure the news gets out right away. But I think a half hour, an hour, you know, you could wait a little bit longer and actually think about it more and maybe come up with a better description, a better interpretation, a better analysis. I would rather read something two days later, a month later, that actually informs and changes my mind than reading something a half hour after an event that essentially repeats everything else that everyone else has been writing about it a half hour later. They're basically saying the same stuff. They played this song, they played that song, they played that song, done. I can get the set list online. You're not telling me anything. I like writing to... Writing is a, I think of it as 
a sacred craft. You're really using words to express something to folks who couldn't have been there that night when I was. And your responsibility is to tell them something that makes them wish they were there and maybe will make the effort to go out and see that artist when they get the chance. You're, you're communicating. And communicating should be work. And I think it should be taken seriously. And I think a lot of online corporations, a lot of online sort of the guys who are creating these uh, avenues, they could put a little more thought into the craft themselves rather than just figuring, you know, how much money can we make and how fast. Uh, when you start an interview, do you have a specific journalistic goal? And how do you choose your subject? How do I choose the subject? Yes. Well, every artist, every subject is different. There are no... That's the great thing about what I do. There are, there are rules in terms of how you do the work, but there are no rules in how you choose it, what you look for. Sometimes I will become interested in something because someone recommended it to me. I don't know it all. At all, at, in any way. I'm just, I'm learning as much as anyone who is doing the reading. And so the choice of a subject or an assignment, you know, you get assignments from editors, but a lot of times the editors will have a certain uh, reason why, like this artist is popular, we should put him on the cover, or, you know, this is a hit record, or people are talking about this artist or there's a kind of a scene happening in this particular city. But a lot of what you end up writing about is what you discover when you get there. So a lot of it is keeping eyes open, ears open, uh, talking to people on the ground, um, at gigs. And if you really want to find out what's going on with a band, talk to the road crew, because they know where all the bodies are buried. They know all the secrets. The, and they're really great storytellers. Session musicians are really good too. I recently did a, a round table for Sirius for their Beatles channel with uh, all of the session musicians who played on John Lennon's album, Mind Games. And the great thing about session musicians is they kept diaries, so they remember everything. And they're completely unfiltered. Like, there's no well, I can't talk about that because management wouldn't like it. To hell with management. I don't work for them. So they'll tell you, yeah, John did this on a particular day, or he really enjoyed, you know, hanging out, or when we were doing a particular song, he would, you know, count out the time and say, nah, a little less echo on the guitar, and you're not playing that beat right. And so I got all of these great stories about John Lennon in the studio you know, really putting the music together and not having John himself there, having the sessions guys there was the next best thing. So a lot of it is sort of, you know, you have to be open to things that are going to happen while you're out there. Like if you're on the road, um, something that'll happen backstage or during a show or on the, just in the bus ride. Um, I'm always taking notes mentally, if not literally, with uh, pen and paper. And when I get back from a trip, I type everything out um, in some organized, not outline, but almost chronologically. This happened on February 24th, 25th, 26th, first show, second show. And when I'm doing even a record review, particularly one of some substance, like a lead review for Rolling Stone or Mojo, I will do a song by song outline. I will sit there, I'll, I've been listening to this record say for quite a while, but I will actually spend like an afternoon, headphones, staring at the screen, or back when it was a typewriter, um, I will type out everything that comes into my head while I'm listening to that song, regardless of what it is. A mental image, a lyric that jumps out, 
this guitar sort of comes in in this pattern versus the way the harmonies are stacked, and I will type it all out. I will do like a 10-page track-by-track outline of that record, even if the review is only 500 words. Because every thought that I've had as I'm doing it, it could come in handy. A phrase might be worthwhile. Just something that comes into my head. This sounds like, I don't know what would be the equivalent. You know, this distortion sounds like a psychotic goose. You know, and just to put it down. Maybe it's not worth anything, but maybe it is. And having all of that material, it means that I've got a lot to work from and I haven't just forgotten it. You know, you never know when you're going to have a good idea. So write it all down. Mm -hmm. um, that didn't quite answer your question, but <laughs> you can uh, have that one anyway. Thank you so much. Uh, can you share some thoughts and talk about an interview of yours that you consider has a historical value for us? We had this discussion earlier yeah, today. Yeah, but still, it's so interesting <laughs> yeah. and important to um, discuss. It's, a, it's an interview I get asked about a lot, and it was the last major interview that Kurt Cobain of Nirvana did before he sadly uh, took his own life. It, I get asked about it a lot because it was the last one, and sadly his loss, it still resonates. I have people come up to me about that interview still all the time, and this was 29 years ago, uh, April of 1994. Um, I actually did the interview, today is the 19th, this, I think it was this particular week, was the, it's the 30th anniversary of the interview itself. It was in October, mid-October of 1993. Um, Nirvana were playing, they were on the In Utero tour, uh, Kurt's last tour, and uh, they were in Chicago, a place called the Aragon Ballroom. And I had been trying to get Kurt to do a major sit-down Q&A with Rolling Stone for a number of months because this record was coming out. And he was talking to all kinds of magazines. And I was like, come on, man, you know, this, we are the magazine of record. You know, you got we would really, this would be a great forum for you to talk about music, not just about being a celebrity and everything else you don't like about being a rock star. And I was at my office, I was actually music editor at the time, I was at my office uh, one Friday afternoon, the phone rang, and I just picked it up, I went, yeah, I said, David? I said, yeah, I said, this is Kurt. And I went, oh, hey, nice to talk to you. I'd met him previously. I said, uh, what's going on? He said, look, man, I know you're a little sore at me, we haven't done this thing. He said, I really do want to do this interview with you. But I don't want to be giving you the same answers I'm giving to every other magazine I talk about. I want to give it a little time. I said, that's cool. Um, when you're ready, let me know. And I'm there. And I got the call. I said, look, why don't you come to Chicago? Went to Chicago. And uh, they were playing two shows at the Aragon Ballroom. I was there on the second night. And uh, I'm sitting with the, the press guy really great uh, friend of mine, Jim Merlis, and we're watching the show, and the show is a disaster. <laughs> like, the audience was a lot of sort of like mosh pit guys, you know, sort of pushing people around, and it was really kind of not a pleasant scene on the floor, and you could tell Kurt was not happy. And the best way you could tell that Kurt was not happy is that they did not play Smells Like Teen Spirit. And when the show was over and they hadn't played that, I turned to Jim, I said, I'm screwed, he's not gonna do this, he's too pissed off. And Jim said, I know, we went through all this, it's not gonna happen, whatever. So he said, let's go backstage anyway. So we went backstage and uh, there was a stairway that went up to the dressing room, and Kurt was at the, stop of the, at the top of the stairway with a cup of tea. And uh, as we were walking up, he said, welcome to the worst show on the tour. I thought, oh, 
God, this is not going to work. And we got out there. I said, look, man, I know the gig wasn't so great for it. I said, look, if you don't want to do this tonight, we can reschedule. I said, no, we'll do it. It's cool. We're going to take care of it. And about two hours later, I was in his hotel room. It was 1 a.m. And we talked for about two and a half hours. And we talked about music. We talked about his life. We talked about his addictions. Uh, we talked about songwriting. You know, he finally admitted that he had basically stolen the whole chorus for Smells Like Teen Spirit from the Pixies. And we actually had a really good conversation. And the way I could tell was at that particular point, uh, Kurt's management and PR were a little paranoid about interviews about Kurt being misquoted. And so what they were doing was, you know, I had a cassette recorder. And they were also recording the interview. So the PR guy would bring out and put a second tape recorder on the table to tape as well. So that if the story comes out and they said, oh, well, he didn't say that, they have the tape to prove it. And so Jim, the PR guy, my friend, he dutifully comes out to put the tape recorder on the table. And Kurt turns to him and says, no, we don't need it. He's cool. He's like, okay, he trusts me. And so we talked, we had that two and a half hour conversation and he did make that famous quote that, you know, I asked him about the song, I hate myself and I want to die. And he said, look, it was meant as a joke. And I've been asked about that a lot. And I think at that moment, he did believe it was a joke. He had written it that way because everybody thought he was kind of a spoiled rock star brat. And he wanted to make the point that, look, I take this music seriously. This is, this is really important. It's a life to me. It's why I'm alive. And I think what happened in the next six months was that the music, the music wasn't enough to save him from himself. And when he, he did die, um, that morning, uh, my friend uh, Kurt Loder, who was the news anchor at MTV, he said, look, come on over, just we'll get on the air, we'll talk about Kurt. And so we did. And one of the things I said was that uh, I honestly believed that he was the John Lennon of his generation because he spoke in his songs, in conversations like the one I had with him, you know, he spoke the truth as he saw it. And that was something that Lennon did all the time. Even if he didn't like all the records he made as a solo artist or whatever, um, this is his truth. And I think what happened is that when he died, and in such a, really a senseless way, um, and, that, and when I say senseless, it's because we don't have the sensibility to understand it to understand whatever was weighing on him to that degree that he would take that act. Um, we, we just, we miss having him here because of all of the music and all of the writing that he could have done and that would have fulfilled him and fulfilled us. I feel the same way about Jimi Hendrix and Jim Morrison and all the other artists that I've had to write obituaries for. But I think the Kurt interview is probably the most historical in that way. And the thing is, I just happened to be there to do the interview. And he did what he felt he had to do not long after that. There is a little bit of a postscript, though. I'm sorry if I'm going on, but I tend to do that. Um, about... This would have been in 20, uh, spring of 2015. There was a film that came out. It was a documentary on Kurt called Montage of Heck, which I highly recommend if you haven't seen it. And one of the executive producers was uh, Kurt and Courtney's daughter, Frances Bean, who I met that day at the interview because she was like, you know, 12 months old and running around backstage. But I did an interview with Frances about the film because it was very important for her to get this film made. And as I was interviewing her, I had the cassette recorder with which I had interviewed Kurt 
on the chair between us. So she's speaking into the same cassette machine that her father talked into. And during the conversation, I mentioned that. I said, this is actually the, the machine that I recorded your dad with. And she just looked at it like it was like a holy relic. And she said, can I take a picture of it? I said, sure. She got out her cell phone, took a picture of it. And that was, it was an eerie moment, but it was also really beautiful because it was an example of her being able to make a connection with her father in a moment where we were talking about him, but here was something that actually had been in his presence at the time we did that interview. It was really, and I still have that cassette machine. I'm not selling it, I'm not throwing it out. <laughs> I'm taking it with me into the afterlife. It's a really special, it's, so there's, that's historical for me, that machine, because he was there at that moment. Fascinating, thank you, David. <laughs> Uh, do you sometimes uh, impose self-censorship on what you're writing and on your opinion as a critic, music critic? Do I censor myself? Yes, no. in a way. No, never. If it's true, it gets out. Um, and I don't think anyone that I've spoken to or worked for has ever suggested it. You know, that's not part, that's not one of the rules. I will be judicious about, you know, when someone is talking about, say, their personal life, you know, what's relevant to the discussion that we're having. Um, but I would never, no, censor, censorship is what people do when they don't want the truth to get out. And, you know, maybe I'm only writing a record review or interviewing a musician, but the standard of truth still applies. And I'm supposed to be responsible about the reporting. And telling the totality of the story as best I can in the space that one has and the amount of time I have to get the story done. But no, I would never censor. I, I won't censor myself. Um, I will, as I said, I'll be judicious about people's personal lives um, if I feel that it's unimportant or it just brings in something that's completely irrelevant and maybe embarrasses somebody. But um, I've never had anyone say, don't print that. Now, if you say it's off the record, which is, as journalists would know, it's like, okay, if you want something off the record, you have to tell me it's off the record. And when you're done being off the record, we decide when we're on. But you don't get to say it and then come back to me later saying, well, I was off the record. I said, no, you didn't say that. Therefore, it doesn't apply. Um, and if you explain why you don't want it in there, I'll take it under consideration. But... No, I'm, no. Okay. The, the answer is no. How important is musical critique, even I guess more important in this digital era that everybody has his own opinion in Facebook, on Instagram? Well, everyone is entitled to an opinion. I believe in free speech. Free speech is an absolute. You either have it or you do not. Everyone is entitled to an opinion. Not everyone should express it. Um, I think that there should be, people should put thought into what they're saying and why. And this is as true of politics as it is of music. Um, I'm also not a big fan of uninformed opinion. Like, if you don't know what you're talking about, either shut up or find out more. Because I don't, I don't need to know simply your opinion. I would like to know something more about what it is you're discussing. 
And if I just started shooting my mouth off about stuff, nobody would care what I thought either. You know, I would like to think that my responsibility is to be informed about what I'm writing and then to express it in a way that's informed, articulate, and actually puts that artist, or puts that person reading, you know, in the moment as best as I can do that. Um, writing online is, you know, it's, it's just a different avenue. The same standards should apply. Just because you're online shouldn't necessarily mean that all the rules of journalism, analysis, critique, and, you know, being fair and being responsible for what you write shouldn't apply. Anyone who writes under a pseudonym online, I am immediately not interested. If you can't put your name on it and stand behind it, then you're not saying anything I want to hear. I want to know who says it and why. Same way when I have a byline, if somebody doesn't like what I've written, they come straight to me. They'll send me the letter. They'll send the letter to the publication. Fine. I'll have that debate with you. But I'm not going to have it with someone who calls themselves, you know, heavy metal frog or whatever the fuck it is, you know. <laughs> Put your name on it. Stand by it and be prepared to defend it. But just firing stuff out online. I don't read the comment section online, ever. Because nine times out of ten, people are just blowing smoke, as we say. Uh, digital, it's... It's another avenue. It's, it can be a magazine without paper, but the same rules should apply. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you this sage old uh, question? What is good music? <laughs> Anything <Do> I you? <laughs> like? <laughs> yes, um, of course. <laughs> what is good music? I'm going to fall back on an old quote from Duke Ellington, a great composer, the American jazz composer. There are two kinds of music. There's good music and there's bad music. And bad music, you can generally tell what's bad in that it doesn't have much thought behind it. Um, it's not, even if it's something well played, it feels very thin. It feels like it doesn't have any soul. Um, it's made to be a product. Um, good music... Good music makes me want to hear more. It gives me an idea that there's something more to this artist, to this genre, to this song um, that can be be gained by it. Um, I kind of mistrust when I listen to something and immediately really like it because I'm not sure if that's just a surface response or I'm really connecting with it. A lot of times there are records, artists, shows where it doesn't really connect initially, but I'll go back and go, you know, I should, I should stay a little bit longer with this. Um, the other kind of distinction and we were talking about this earlier today. I was reading, this was just last night while I was having dinner. I was reading a magazine, an American jazz magazine called Downbeat. And there was an interview with a musician there from New Orleans. And he was um, recalling a quote from the trumpeter Dizzy Gillespie. He'd been working with him. This was back in the day. And he said, uh, you know, Dizzy Gillespie told me this one thing about music. And he said, you know, the real music, the best music that gets made when you do it, you have to keep one foot in the future and one foot in the blues. Meaning, you should always be facing forward, but never lose your soul. Don't leave the soul behind. And to me, that's the perfect description of good music. It's like something new. It's something that we haven't had even the day before. And the person that's doing it is trying to carry us forward with him or her um, in that moment, in that performance, in that song. That's good music. You know, anything that makes my day better than it was when I got up that morning, 
is good music. Anything that doesn't, I'll just put it to the side. Can you name some, uh, some of your favorites? <laughs> Please. You're talking to a guy with 10,000 records. Yes, I know. Um, <laughs> Difficult answer. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I can tell you the first record I ever bought. It's a 45 painted black by the Rolling Stones. That pretty much sums me up in a lot of ways. Um, I, I also grew up, I was in junior high and high school when a lot of the music was beginning to happen in San Francisco. So certainly bands like Jefferson Airplane, Quicksilver, Messenger Service, Big Brother with Janis Joplin, The Grateful Dead, they were all a big part of my first awakening. First time I heard Frank Zappa and the Mothers of Invention. The first Velvet Underground record the banana album, which I have in mono with the banana complete on the cover, and it's signed by all four members of the wow. Velvet Underground, <laughs> including Lou, John, Sterling, and Mo. Um, Velvet Underground was huge for me. And that connection to the Velvets became even more important because I got a chance to interview Lou Reed multiple times over a 30-year period, I interviewed John, Kale, I got to know Sterling Morrison and Mo, Mo Tucker. I met, I met Nico once at gig. Um, these connections, like a lot of the records that were really important for me, they helped carry me into the work and be open to the stories that they had to tell as I tried to find out how that music got made and how they progressed through it. You know, you listen to Lou Reed's records over the course of almost a half century. And even at the end of his life, he was making records that challenged what people knew, what they thought they knew about him. I think one of the best records he ever made, and this is a matter of debate for a lot of people, is the album he made with Metallica, Lulu. He made it actually two years before he died. And it's, a record that a lot of people didn't like because people who loved Metallica thought Lou Reed was, he couldn't sing and he was crazy. And everybody who liked Lou Reed thought, why is he slumming with Metallica? And I'm going, these are two transformational artists, revolutionary, each in his own way, coming together and making something entirely new. And I was lucky enough to be at one of those recording sessions and to watch Lou recording, performing, and singing live in the studio with Metallica playing and seeing the look on James Hetfield's face as he's watching this guy work. You know, this was not just superstars trying to make a buck. They were actually trying to take everything they did individually forward to another place together. And one of the things that, uh, warmed my heart after uh, Lou's passing, which was very sad for me, was that um, I saw an interview with uh, Laurie Anderson, his, his wife, the artist, and she said that shortly after Lou passed, actually right after Lou passed, David Bowie called her and said, you know, 10, 20 years, people are gonna finally understand that Lulu is one of the greatest albums that Lou ever made. And this is coming from David Bowie. So I thought, me and Bowie, we agree on this. I felt <laughs> really good about that. Um, so many opportunities, you know, interviewing Ornette Coleman, the great jazz saxophonist. Um, all the time I've spent on the road with Metallica, with Stones, being able to talk with uh, the guys in U2 in Dublin, Ireland while they're rehearsing for a tour. And then I guess maybe the other great moment for me was uh, one of the, actually the first time I interviewed the Stones, I got to go to uh, Morocco with Mick and Keith because they were making this album, Steel Wheels, and they were actually gonna record with this um, Moroccan traditional group, the master musicians of Shizuka, who had been playing music for like centuries up in the hills. And uh, they had been recorded by Brian Jones in 1968. 
and the idea of going to Morocco and watching them work with the master musicians. And the day after the session, which was in Tangier, um, I went to Jijuka, the village, with uh, Mick to actually hang with some of the musicians and had mint tea in this very, very humble, poor town. And I got to meet one of the musicians who played for Brian Jones. And, you know, I had that album. Brian Jones presents the master musicians of Shizuka. To meet one of the guys who was on that record, um, you know, this is a great life. You can't beat it. I've got the best job in the world. Yes, I know. And <laughs> I love it, and I appreciate it, and I don't, I really don't want to waste it. You know, if I've got a great job, I've got to make sure everybody that I get to communicate with understands how much it means to me, and hopefully I can share some of these stories, and, and then maybe you go out and you listen to the master musicians, or you check out Lulu, and even if you don't, hopefully I've told a good story, and you got a little something out of that that maybe brightens the day for an hour. Yeah, and you love live music, right? Which was live your last music. concert? Zappa had it right, man. He said, live music, beauty is not truth, truth is not beauty, etc., etc. Live music is the best. I love records. I have way too many. Um, but you go to a gig, you never know what you're going to see. Um, you never know what's going to happen, because often the musicians don't know. And... You could walk out of there and just have your mind changed and your mind blown. And I also make it a rule to show up for the opening act. If somebody's going to, you know, put in that 45 minutes ahead of the headliner and put in some hard work and then I gotten paid as much, I feel it's my responsibility to show up for the opening act. And I never leave early. I will always stay to the end of the set and the encore. Because you never your... know what's going to happen yeah. in the encore. For all you know, Bob Dylan's going to come out and sing along. So you want to be there for that. Yeah. So you went to see Metallica recently, right? I did. They did yeah. uh, they're doing this tour, uh, No Two Alike, where they play two nights, two days, really, in each city in a stadium. And each show is completely different. So I went to both shows in, both shows in New Jersey. And... The people who went on the first night, they got Master of Puppets. The people who went on the second night didn't get Master of Puppets, they got Enter Sandman. So it's a great concept, and um, they were spectacular. They were, it's, they've really put the effort into creating an experience that brings 80,000 people somehow closer to the band. They're playing in the round on this stage that's sort of like a big oval, and they just go all around that ramp plant. There's four drum kits in different places so that Lars can be close to a different part of the crowd each time. And they're all running around and clearly loving what they do to the same degree that they were, you know, when I first saw them in 1986 opening for Ozzy. And one of the things, and their commitment to their audience, I think, is something that is less than a lot of folks could pay attention to. That, you know, saying you love your fans and you're taking care of them on social media, that's good and it's important. But the personal touch, you know, for Metallica, you know, trying to be personal with 80, personal with 80,000 people, they create, they have the snake pits. So you, people can actually stand inside the stage and you can be on the floor next to them. And even if you're up in the rafters, you know, because the stage goes out so far, you're a lot closer than, say, if the stage was at the far end of the uh, stadium. And it's the same mentality as when I first went on tour with them for And Justice For All. They were playing these gigs. They were in Birmingham, uh, Dublin, and Belfast. And this was Belfast when they were still, it was still a very difficult time there. But they would play the gig, they played for two hours, and then they would set up a table backstage with a bunch of chairs and they would towel down and about half hour after the show's over, James, Lars, Kirk, and at that point Jason Newstead, they come out and they sit in the chairs and they would sit in those chairs 
for two and a half hours and shake everybody's hand who was back there. That The kids would line up outside the venue. And they did this even in Belfast where it was dangerous. Um, people would line up, they'd each go down the table, they'd sign autographs, take pictures, no cell phones, this is like real cameras. Um, shake hands, hey man, thanks for coming. Oh, James, man, this means a lot. I said, no worries, man, you know. They would do this all night until the last person got through that line. That is social media. That's the work that it takes to really have something that is going to carry you as an artist through life. And even if you don't have the hit records, you know, down the line, the connection you've made with somebody is something that person can take home. And they can say, you know, that guy in Metallica, I actually got to shake his hand backstage in Belfast in 1988. And that still means a lot to me. I feel the same way about that cassette recorder. <laughs> Are you interested, uh, besides uh, Western music, of course, um, are you interested in music from different parts of the world, like Balkans or Asia or um, Eastern music? Are you keen and um, intrigued to know more, to meet new people? Yes, I am. And one of the great things about having the job to the degree to the degree that I have is I get to travel a lot. And whenever I go abroad, I'm always looking for record stores. I'm always looking for recommendations. Um, if I'm going to an event like this, I want to see the live music. Um, I've, I've told this story a lot in interviews, but my father uh, traveled a lot for his work. And when I was in high school, what he would do when he would go to a country, he'd you know, take a minute to go just like walking around town. He'd go into a record store. My father really didn't know anything about music. Didn't know a thing. But he would go into a store and say to the guy behind the counter, he said, you know, my kid collects records. What do you got that's new and hot? And the guy would say, oh, well, I got this, I got that. And they would have the turntable there. And he'd put it on the turntable and he'd play it. And my dad would say, oh, God, that's awful. He'll love it. <laughs> and he, he went to England in 1968. He brought back the first Jeff Beck album, first album by Keith Emerson and the Nice, and the first album by a British band that I still love called The Move. I have all three of those records. Um, he went to Germany and brought back the first Faust album and the first two Can albums. Uh, he's bought, he bought me singles in Egypt, uh, records in Turkey, albums in Denmark, Finland, South Africa. Um, I've got so many wonder, they're, and then they're real keepsakes. When he passed, uh, my father passed, you know, that was the thing that I was able to say to services, you know, I don't really have a lot of pictures of him, I don't have a lot of artifacts, but I have every single record he ever bought me in my collection. And I pull them out and listen to them all the time. And now, whenever I go out, I get, people give me things, which is really wonderful. Um, and I've discovered a lot of music that way. But I love going out and seeking it out and buying records. I've been to Iceland about 15 or 20 times. I think I have the biggest collection of Icelandic music in New York City, from <laughs> things I bought, uh, records that people gave me, collector's items by Seeger Ross and Bjork, the Sugar Cubes. I saw the Sugar Cubes in 1988 in Iceland. and got all of those original records, um, which I still have. So I'm, I am an explorer, you know, and I do it for myself. Um, and a lot of times what happens is when I discover something that really is exciting, I get to write about it. And I've been able to do that for artists outside the U.S. And it's been of some help to them to get gigs, to come over, to get some recognition. And one of the things that I now do a lot is I write letters of recommendations for touring visas because artists have so much trouble getting through the bureaucracy of American immigration. So, you know, acts that I've written about or gotten to know, I always write visa letters for them saying, please let them in. I'd like to see them play, okay? 
enough with the bureaucracy. Just stamp them, yes. But, you know, it's, my, it's part of my giving back for everything I get from them. Mm -hmm. So the long answer to your question is yes. I guess there are much more questions from Sorry, our I'm, audience. So while you're preparing the mics, I would love to ask you just a few brief rapid fire questions. There is no such thing as a rapid answer, but I'll do my no. best. No, <laughs> but still, are you ready? Okay, yeah. Okay, wish you were here or the dark side of the moon. <laughs> I'm going to answer that question by saying a saucer full of secrets. Okay, David. Second Floyd album. Because that was the first one I bought. Okay. Does Bob Dylan deserve the Nobel Prize in Literature? Yes. Everything he's written is literature. There's... Anyone who thinks that songwriting is not literature is not really paying attention to the art of songwriting. Okay. Uh, Paul Rogers or Adam Lambert? <laughs> Funny enough, I just interviewed Paul Rogers for right. the radio the other week, and we talked about Adam Lambert because of the two. I, I'm going to answer that question by saying Freddie Mercury. I, I'm sorry, I got to Easy see answer. him. I got to see him on the Bohemian Rhapsody tour, so that's the only answer I can give. Okay, among the musicians you've interviewed, who's a cooler person than their music suggests? <laughs> Hmm, cooler person. Frank Zappa. Because Frank Zappa was a guy who thought people who acted cool were jerks. And, you know, he had no, no patience with people who sort of pranced around being rock stars. He thought, man, you know, that's, you know, why do you have to do that? And in fact, Frank was one of the coolest and smartest people I ever interviewed him. I interviewed him on several occasions. And one of my favorite images of him was I, I went to his hotel room in New York and we were going to do this interview and he pushes me in. He says, okay, have a seat. I'll be with you in a second. And he went into, it was a hotel suite, and he was in the sort of the bedroom with a couple of guys, um, obviously musicians and fans, and he was sitting with them, and on the, on the bed he had spread out the sheet music, and it was one of his compositions. I think it was the Black Page, which is one of his most dense, complex pieces that he had ever written. And he was going over the composition with these two young guys, these two musicians, you know, this is what we do here, and this is how this is played. And, you know, just really taking time to speak with them. They weren't in his band. They weren't famous. They were just a couple of fans who sent, managed to get some time with him. And he sat there for about 20 minutes, a half hour, and explained and talked with them about this piece, about music, what it meant, you know, what he was trying to approve trying to do, and then they got up and left. He just made me sit there for a half hour and wait for this to be done. And I thought, that was the coolest thing I ever saw because he put the fan first, not the promo, not the journalist, but the fan. And you don't get any cooler than that because that's like Metallica sitting there for two and a half hours signing autographs. Yes, I have a role to play, and yes, the artist respects me enough to spend that much time with me. And I did get a chance to speak to Frank on a number of occasions, but on that particular afternoon, the fan came first. And it was the coolest thing I'd ever seen him do and one of the coolest things I'd ever seen anybody do. Fantastic. Stadium concert or club gig? There's no difference. If you, if you are, if you really know how to work a stadium, you can almost make it feel like a club. That's the art of performance. Even if you're a half a mile away and you feel that excited and connected, it feels like a club. Springsteen can do it, U2 can do it, the Stones can do it, um, Metallica can do it. And then if you get to see somebody in a club, 
that's, that's an unbeatable experience as well. And some people make a club feel like a stadium, like the whole world is there. Even if it's like, you know, 10 people and a few of your friends have shown up, you can still make it feel like it's the biggest room in the world. Okay, and uh, my final question, John Lennon or Paul McCartney? I'm sorry? John Lennon oh. or Paul McCartney? <laughs> oh. Ringo Starr, because without him, there'd have been no backbeat. <laughs> okay, now is your turn. Please use the mics. David is still here with us. Thank you so much, David. Thank you. What do you got? Hi. Hi. Um, my name is Nasco. I'm part of Stereofox, which is a music publication. Uh, first of all, I wanted to say thanks for this wonderful lecture and the stories you made us part of, you know, experience music history. Um, I'm too young to have experienced that, though. <laughs> Thank you. Um, You'll have your own experiences, don't worry. Yeah, I'm eagerly waiting for that. <laughs> but I wanted to ask you, um, what's the future of music journalism, uh, in your opinion? And I'm asking this in the light of uh, Billboard laying 30% of their stuff, music publications like OK Player closing down, uh, Bandcamp just laid off 50% of their editorial stuff, etc., etc. I'm giving this as a context. So do people care about blogging? What do you think? I, I do fear for the uh, future of writing as really a life. You know, I'm lucky enough to have done this for my entire life. You know, since I was in, you know, since I was 17. You know, when I was doing it in school. And to be able to have uh, to work for publications where you could make a living even as a freelancer and certainly being on staff at Rolling Stone for 30 years, that's, that's, it was unusual, but at the same time, it was not unheard of. But the economics of journalism and music have changed dramatically. And one of the reasons there isn't a lot of print journalism is the same reason that people don't buy records in the same numbers that they used to because of the convenience online and the fact that online, you don't have to pay for it. You know, you like I said, with Spotify and Apple, you're renting the music. If you're reading publications online, um, it's not like you're putting a dime in your phone in order to have the ability to read something. You know. Some publications do have paywalls, but a lot of people then ignore those publications because they have to pay for them. I think this notion that music should be free is a misnomer. It's really a misunderstanding of the whole idea that when people make music, they're investing their lives in it. The best, certainly the best musicians and the best you know, artists, so why shouldn't we invest in the work? And I feel the same way about writing. I will write for free for an artist, maybe do a bio or a review or write something for a, a, you know, an occasion, but that's my choice. It should be my choice to write for free, not, not the world. So you, even troubadours in the Middle Ages, you know, if they came to town and sang the news of the day, someone would give them lunch. They'd give them a couple of eggs, buy them a beer. There's no difference. You know, I think we have to really re... We should reframe the debate that it's not about the future of journalism, it's the future of our engagement with art and what it does for our lives, and what it means to help keep an artist alive. You know, they don't live on air. Um, that's actually probably the biggest fear I have. I think people who really want to make music and who really want to write will do it regardless, because it's, it's your passion. You need to do it. If I had never made it as a professional journalist, 
I'm sure I would have found a way to write for my community, you know, online, and maybe do it for free because I had another job. But that should be my choice. I shouldn't be forced into making that decision. And if we look at music and writing and really any art like that um, in a different way, then we'd all be better off. Uh, the more time people have to spend on their art rather than social media is uh, a benefit to the art. And as I say, my favorite social media is just sitting here and talking. You know, writing, that's my social media. I'm not on Facebook, I'm not on Instagram, I'm not on whatever the hell they call Twitter now because that guy's an asshole. Um, I don't need it and I don't want it. I'd rather, you know, talk to you in a bar. For one thing, there's liquor there. Yeah. Um, and there'll probably be music. So, yeah, I, I definitely worry about what's facing yourself, you know, everyone who's here, because I've had a lot of my ride already, but I still have to deal with it every day. And I know I get paid less for my writing than I used to. I'm not happy about it. I try to make it up in other ways by doing a lot more work. Um, how that's going to play out in the future, I wish I knew. But I do believe that if the music moves you enough and you like the art and the craft and the commitment of writing, you'll find a way to do it. And that was true of me when I was writing record reviews for $5 a review. Um, then again, five dollars went a long way. Don't give up. If it means that much to you, you won't give up. And if nothing else, you're going to have a lot of great stories to tell. Thank you. Thank you for the question, of course. Do we have other questions, please? Uh, it's a follow-up question. Sure. Um, the Obviously, the media landscape has transformed dramatically since the 60s to contemporary uh, world for music, just particularly focusing on music. And uh, a lot of the, the media that I grew up with and you grew up with doesn't exist anymore in any form. The, what are the consequences of that transformation for the music makers? Not the financial consequences, but as gatekeepers, uh, you know, obviously from a from a, from a consumer of media, um, it's primarily the gatekeeping role that, in, that is the most exciting, let's say. I mean, it's all right, it's fine to read an in-depth interview with Keith Richards, but what's really exciting is to be led to something that you didn't know existed yeah. and that you discover through a review or whatever and you go out and buy it and you get, and you get into it and become a fan. And that process has changed. So the, the question is, it, it, you could say how it's changed, but particularly what the consequences for music that's being made today, um, and which might be in its way uh, just as w wonderful as music that was made 50 years ago, but m maybe doesn't have the same opportunities to get out there. I, I would, the, the one thing that I would, before I get to the actual answer, I would, I would lose the word gatekeeper. I prefer to think of myself as a curator. Gatekeeping suggests keeping people in and out. Like, don't go there, go here. What I would do is say, you know that thing over there? It's worth looking at. Um, this thing over here, it actually affected me in a way that made me want to express something, either in writing or now on the radio. I think the effect, as, as you're asking, the effect on the artist is that they have fewer avenues to get their point across. You know, you can, you can get your music online. That's actually not that hard. But you're there with about eight zillion other people. And the one thing about magazine journalism is I got to experience it, the original FM radio and the sort of things uh, Elena's doing over at Z-Rock and what I get to do with Sirius and all the other uh, DJs and hosts that are there, is that we're, we're curating our passions through the work. 
and doing it in an informed way that hopefully excites other people. What the artists are losing is the forum to be heard and to be understood. You know, the ability for me to do a 3,000 word feature on whether it's a large, a big star like Keith, 3,000 word interview, or, you know, somebody new that I'm excited about, even getting like 500 or 900 words in uh, Rolling Stone the way I used to on bands with their first album. You haven't even played, made an album yet, they just have a single. Um, that avenue is very, very diminished because, as you say, the print publications are not there. And if you do it online, you're, you're sort of shouting into a crowd, you know, because so many other people are doing it. And that act of curation, the way people curate a museum, except I'm curating a living museum, one that's happening right now. It's not paintings that were done 400 years ago. Um, that's, that's, that's a great loss because I think being able to be heard and to be understood in your work is valuable to the artist because then what comes back to the artist is, um, well, maybe I should think about something else too or maybe that point that the, the writer made is worth thinking about. One of, the, one of the great quotes that I got, and I got this early on, actually before I started writing, I was actually a subscriber to Rolling Stone. There was an interview in 1968, I'm dating myself, but who cares, um, with John Lennon. When Jonathan Cobb, one of the original writers at Rolling Stone, was interviewing John Lennon. This was on the occasion of the White Album, the, the double album that the Beatles put out. And they're doing this Q&A, and in the introduction, Jonathan is describing sitting down with Lennon, we're having this talk, and one of the things Lennon says to him, even before they start the interview, and he says, look, I know you're doing an interview, you're gonna ask me questions, and I'm gonna give you answers, but what we're really gonna have is a conversation, like we're doing now. You're gonna learn things about me, I'm gonna learn things about you, and about how you are hearing what I do as a musician, as a songwriter. And out of that conversation is going to be a third thing. The, the understanding and the meanings and the discoveries that we're each going to take away from this. He'll print about it, he'll think about it, but it's something that we create together. And I get that, I had that with uh, Patti Smith as well. I've interviewed her a number of times and she always refers to her art, to the interviews we do as work. This is work and we benefit from it, we learn from it, and not having those avenues is a real loss. And I would love for another way to come out, to be invented, to be developed where that's possible. And not only is it possible, but the writers, as well as the artists, can be fairly compensated for that work. Um, writing is an art as well. I wish there was more of it. I hope that there's another way in technology, in media, for this to, uh, for this to happen. Someone other than me is gonna have to invent it, but I'm happy to sign on as soon as they do. Not exactly a happy thought, but there you go. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, please. Um, hi, David, first of all, thank you for this. Um, I'm here. <laughs> yeah, oh, thank you. you sorry. Hi. Uh, thank you for this master class in musical storytelling, uh, as I would call it. Uh, my name is Sofia. I'm a fellow journalist. I run a digital publication dedicated to music and photography. It's called Dinia Magazine. And although I have like a billion questions, I'll just start with one. Um, have you ever worked or interviewed an artist that you kind of disliked on a basic human level or that you have like, that your values didn't align with theirs? And if the answer is yes, how did you manage to um, create a genuine connection in order to write after that, like an in-depth interview, an article representing that artist? Thank you. Uh, I have, I've never, take, I've never taken an assignment where 
it was someone that I didn't, I don't want to say that I didn't respect, but that I felt it just wasn't going to be worth either of our time. I don't, I don't, I, I don't usually turn down assignments, and I rarely turned one down at the magazine at Rolling Stone, but that was largely because the editors that I worked with, they, they knew where I was coming from. They also knew that there would be incidents, like people I would speak to, that might be a little off my usual kind of frame of reference, but that, that also brings a different context to the artist, like they're talking to someone that they might not necessarily talk to. And by the same token, I'm learning something from them. Uh, I've never really had to go through that. I've had incidents where I've been interviewing someone for a story and the interview was not going well and the artist was being kind of a pain in the ass. Uh, I don't like this question, I don't like this, you know, this is a stupid question. And there was one incident in particular, I got this, I was interviewing a guy in a band as part of a feature on this band. And finally I just looked and I said, man, if you don't want to do this, I'm out of here. I'm not going to do that. You know, why are we wasting each other's time? And he had a drug problem. And he was clearly not in a good place. And we went through this for about 25, 30 minutes. And I finally said, you know, I'm just going to be, I'm going to say exactly what I said to him. Fuck it, man, I'm out of here. I'm done. You know, I wish you all the best, but this isn't going anywhere. And I got up and left. And I went back to the manager and I said, you know, this guy, he was really a bit of an asshole. And he just went, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> and about three weeks later, he quit the band. And about 10 years after that, he came back. He rejoined the band. And I was doing another feature, news story about the next record, and I was talking with uh, the singer, and I said to him, I said, you know, I'm, I'm going to be talking with you-know-who. I said, I don't know, I really don't want, I don't think I should bring this up, you know, our previous encounter. I said, don't even bother, he, he won't remember it. And I got together with him, we sat down, we had a great conversation. I ended up having like three or four interviews with him over time. It was just, he had a bad day, he was in a bad place, and I didn't prolong the experience, but I didn't hold it against him. When we got back together again, it was like we were a house on fire. It happens. And you just deal with it in the moment. I would like the artist, whoever I'm talking to, to respect the fact that I showed up and I came prepared. I did have this experience also once with, I'm going to say it out loud, it was the guy from Journey, Steve Perry. He hated journalists because journalists made fun of his band. But he had a solo record. I got an assignment to go. So I went and talked to him. And he, started, he was just like, man, you, you, why are you even here? You don't like my band. I said, dude, I showed up because you wanted to do this. I thought it was worth doing. My editor thought it was worth doing. I actually like your record. If you think I'm a jerk, I'll leave. He said, man, I don't want to do this. And I said, great, I'm gone. I got up and left. You know, it's a two-way street. It's like Patty says, we're working together. You don't want to do the work? I got other things to do. And so do you. Hmm. <laughs> do we have time for another question? Yeah, I'm cool. Would you please? Yes. Hi. Um, hello, David. Thank you for this lecture. Uh, my name is Dimish. I'm a musician. And I'm also studying journalism. So I have this question that's uh, bothering all of us musicians, uh, how do we get uh, media's attention? Like, we'll put a new song out, we'll send a song to the media publisher, and they don't give a damn about our song, but uh, uh, we need them to promote our songs, but what do we need to do to get their attention? Um, what do you do? Uh, it's, again, it's very different now because people, you know, one of the things that was always and still is one of the best things about my job is I get the mail and I get to open it and there's a new record in there. 
And I don't get as many records, physical records, as I used to because people are releasing things online or particularly labels, you know, they send out streams. Streams are bullshit. <laughs> you know, everybody's got one. So what? Um, you send me a stream, chances are I won't listen to it because I'm on the computer writing. Um, I think start, start local. You know, that's one way to do it, you know. And really, trying to make a personal contact, as hard as it is, really makes a difference. Um, if I run into somebody who just says, you know, I make some music and we talk a bit about it, and, and maybe he gives me his card. Or if he's got, well, back in the day, it would be a cassette or a CDR. You know, I would listen to it. I might not act on it but I would at least give it the respect that that artist made to make contact. Um, try to just... Let me ask you this. As a journalist yourself, how do you want to be approached? Um, I, I don't have an um, answer. Like real <laughs> Neither answer. do I. But uh, yeah, but uh, I'm always trying to support like bands, even if they send me a Bandcamp or YouTube link, I'll always listen to it. Maybe as like you said, I won't act on it, but uh, I will listen to it definitely. Maybe because I'm a newer generation, you like to see this. I'm okay with if someone sends me a song on Bandcamp or something. So. I'll always listen to it. I'm always trying to support and to listen new music. And well, one of the things that I do get, a lot of times uh, I will get people, I, since I'm not on social media, um, people get my email, and which is fine. Um, the government has it, so why should bands be any different? Um, and people will send me an email and say, look, you know, so-and-so recommended that I write to you, and this is what I do, and here's, you know, sometimes it will be a stream, sometimes it'll be a download, which is easier for me. Um, and I'll download it and either burn it or have it in my iTunes. And when someone actually tries to contact me, then I think, well, they've made a little bit more effort rather than sending out a blanket, you know, they get a giant mailing list and say, you know, to whom it may concern. <laughs> you know, clearly they don't, know me or maybe they haven't read what I do. You know, you want to target people that, you know, you have to kind of do your research, like try to find who are the writers, the radio people, maybe promoters that might be receptive to what you do because you know what they do. If you learn about the people you're going to be in contact with, you'll actually have a better idea of how to present yourself. Um, just sending out things to everybody means that, you know, everybody's got it. But if you try to aim, do, if you do your own research, that gives you a better shot at maybe making a connection. And a lot of times it's just an accident. You know, one of, we were talking about this earlier, one of the bands that I've become very uh, supportive of in New York, it's a, it's a new band, they've only been going a couple of years, they're called Pan Arcadia, they're from Brooklyn. And last summer, I was just walking through Washington Square Park down in Greenwich Village, and I heard this live music, and I thought, it's a live band in the village? That's kind of weird, you know, in the park. You know, they have laws against this stuff. And I just kept going, myself and my wife, and we were, um, there was a band playing, two guitars, bass, and drums, band Pan Arcadia, no merch. They had just set up in the park. They had written their name in chalk, on the sidewalk with their Instagram handle, whatever the hell it is. And I stood there and watched them play, and I really like, kind of had that vibe of the strokes that I really like, that New York edgy guitar thing that I did. Good singer, good original songs. And I stayed for about seven or eight tunes and then just kept walking. I thought, you know, I really like these guys. If I had their music, I'd play it on the radio next week. So when I got home, I just looked them up online. They had a website as everyone does. And they had an email address and I just wrote to them. I said, you know, dear Pan Arcadia, um, I happen to be walking through the park today 
and I saw your band, I saw the, heard the music, I really liked it. And if you got any files, if you send them to me, because they didn't have any real records, send them to me, I'll put them on the radio next week. And the guy immediately wrote back and said, you know, we actually recognized you in the crowd and we were surprised you stayed for as long as you did. And they sent me the files and they were on the radio a week later. It was a total accident. If I had walked through the park a half hour before or after, I would have missed them. I might have heard him some other time, but it was one of those moments when I think, you know, A, I'm the luckiest guy in the world, and B, I stopped and I paid attention. And it didn't, wasn't something they did, but simply being out there and trying to make a connection with folks, it just happened that it worked out. And they have since, you know, been talking to producers, they've put out a full-length album, um, they played in LA, they're headlining clubs in New York. They're actually making that slow road up the hill. And I'm glad I had a small part in that. If they had written to me, I probably would have paid attention as well. But that was a connection that was really exciting for me to be able to jump on that the way I'm sure, you know, when John Landau first saw Bruce Springsteen in 1974, that was my version of it. Um, I think Again, a long roundabout way is to say, you know, people want writers to do the research. Artists, I think, have to do a little research on their own. Seek out the people that you would like to talk to. Seek out the people that you think are gonna react to what you do because they have expressed that in their own tastes and their own writing and their own work. And I think you'll find that doing that extra work, you're gonna make connections that um, are of great value. Okay, thank you so much. This is the end, I guess. Thank you uh, very much for coming and staying. <laughs> I really appreciate it. Thank you for the participation and David to you. Thank you. Probably just in brief the importance of this conference, just in a few sentences. The fact briefly. that this conference is here is really important because it's you know, it's, it's almost like everybody's getting together in the neighborhood. You know, it says Balkans right in the, yeah. the posters. It's, it's a really great event, and I'm really honored that you all have had me here to talk about what little I know. And Fantastic. thank you for staying, and thank you for listening. It really means a lot. Thank you so much. <laughs>